I uh, was going to dive into the SALT series again today, and uh, we will get back to it. Uh, we're going to be talking about the physical part of your life. And I had all my messages, all my notes sent in. They were all ready. They're in the computer. That was the goal until last night. And uh, the Lord put something else on my heart last night. And I wrestled with it last night. And even up until right before, the, the, uh, before I came up here uh, for service of what I was going to preach on. And so I'm, I pushed pause on that. And I'm going to share with you what I believe is a word from the Lord for us today. And so, you excited about that? <laughs> you say that now. <laughs> so, uh, do me a favor. Uh, go ahead and silence your cell phones. Um, I'm normally not bothered by those, but I might be today. So, just let that be a habit when you come in church. You silence your cell phone. It's a good practice. You, you know, you, you can call people and text them later and, and all the things. Turn off your notifications, whatever. <clears throat> all right. So today is, uh, we're celebrating Memorial Day this weekend. And there is a, I'm just so grateful. Just say this. There, I'm so grateful for the thousands of men and women who have gone before us and laid down their lives so that we could have the freedoms that we have in this country. To, to be able to worship in a place like this is, uh, is amazing. And, and I say that, and I want you to, to hear me, because often what happens is that people forget about the freedom that we have. Uh, we have it really good here in the USA. And we have it really, really good in Florida, okay? Um, <clears throat> and um, sometimes it can be so good that we forget how bad it could be. And if time goes on after having it so good, we get comfortable. Um, and I think it's important that we understand that what we have right now in, the, in our lives, and our culture, it's not normal, Okay? It's, it's not normal that you're able to do what you're doing right now and to be able to have the freedom that you have um, that's granted to us by our Constitution. We have a great governor here. Um, I'm, a little, I'm happy and sad. He's, uh, he's throwing in his hat to run for president. He's going to be a great president. Um, and I am going to vote for him. I'm just throwing it out there. If you're saying, well, Pastor, what do you... <laughs> um, he's, uh, but I hate to lose him as a, as a uh, governor too. Anyway, you say, Pastor, uh, this isn't this isn't a place to be political. No, I don't vote politics. I vote Jesus. Okay. So I vote for the person that's going to stand for what Jesus represents, and uh, so I encourage you to do the same to check out your candidate and do the same. Um, the, as I mentioned a moment ago, the problem with freedom, and, and there is a problem with freedom, is that the longer we have it so good, the quicker we forget how bad it can be. And what do I mean by that? Well, we get comfortable. And, and getting comfortable happens when it's been so good that you just... Unless you have been a, in our modern day, you've been a Muslim who's been oppressed in communist China, or you've been, uh, you've lived in Cuba, or you've, you've lived in the former Soviet Union and experienced the oppression that's actually out there, or, and let's just go to Christians who are being persecuted all over Indonesia. There's, what we have here is not normal. And when you get comfortable, what happens over a period of time is that you just go along in order to get along. You go along in order to get along. In other words, you go along with what the culture is saying so that you can get along with everybody in the culture. You go along with what 
everybody is saying so that you don't cause any waves, you don't cause any ripples because heaven forbid that we as Christians would stand out in some way to a, the pagan society that we live in. I'm going to, um, and you may not like where I'm going, but last night my wife and I had, well, she did. I was just living there. She had, <laughs> she had uh, all of the senior, seniors who were graduating this year. They were over at our house last night, and, and they were playing games for a while, and I was listening to their conversation and I was hearing some of the things that they're talking about, what they see in, in life and adulting and uh, what that's going to look like for them. And the thought crossed my mind because this message was running through my mind at the time. And I, I just wondered how many of these young adults who are graduating now into adulting really know the cost of freedom that was paid, the price that was paid for their freedom that they're about to experience and I dare say that maybe a few of them did, but most of them don't. Um, the thousands of men and women who risk their lives so that we're not a communist or a socialist or a Marxist country right now it gives us the ability to <laughs> worship in a house like this. People who gave their lives for generations of people that they would never know or meet. And here we are today, the recipients of their sacrifice. And like always, as we see the, from the beginning of original sin with Adam and Eve, it would be heresy for us to say that it's all good from now on, that it'll never happen again. It's going to continue to happen because we as humans continue to seek what serves us best. And that's why the church is still on the earth today and will continue to be because the church is here to be the influence and in the moral fabric of our culture. I'll say this probably three or four times in this message today. It's not the government's job to tell the church what to do. It's the church's job to tell the government how things should be done. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor during World War II in Germany. How many of you know of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Okay. Less than first service. I'm going to take a moment to share a little bit who he was. He was one of the few pastors in Germany in the 19, early 1930-31 who recognized where Hitler and Nazi Germany was going. He recognized before the Nazis came to power where Hitler was going, and he began to speak against the Nazi regime, and he began to speak against Hitler, knowing where this wickedness would end up. And there were 18,000 pastors who were Protestant pastors in Germany at that time, and it came to a point where Hitler led Nazi Germany to create their own church state, okay? So they had their own church. It was run by the state. It was operated and governed by the state. And they had mouth service to who they believed that, uh, who they said they believed that God was. But Hitler was nowhere near a Christian. It was all just a facade in order to help people think that what he was doing was justified. And so 3,000 pastors of the 18,000 actually said, we are going to be a part of the state church, and they came against Bonhoeffer. Now, there were 3,000 other pastors that Bonhoeffer had convinced that this is wrong, and they believed that Hitler was wicked. And so therefore, they started a separate church called the Confessing Church. And those pastors then began to resist Nazi Germany. And in doing so, they were persecuted. But my question is that while there were 3,000 who were sold out, 3,000 who were set against it, where were the other 12,000? And the other 12,000 pastors and churches at that time decided, we don't want to rock the boat. That Hitler's going to be a one term Fuhrer. 
Let's just keep quiet. It'll all change. And the same thing is happening in America today. There's a phrase that, that Bonhoeffer is often attributed to, to saying, and we're not, we can't find it in his words, but it certainly sounds like something he would say. And it's this, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Silence in the face of, ev- in the face of evil is itself evil. Many Christians today are saying the same thing that those Germans pastors and churches were saying then, well, I don't want to seem like a troublemaker. I want to keep my job. I want my friends to like me. I want my neighbors to like me. And we as a nation today are at the same place that the country of Germany was in the 1930s. There's a book written by Eric McTaxis called Letters to the American Church. It came out last year, and he actually, years ago, wrote the biography for Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he describes in this, the letter to American church, when he saw where he made the correlation to their culture and our culture, he said, this was written last year, he said, we are in the very same place that they were when they made the decision not to do what was right. And so I'm I'm here today, church, not to condemn anyone. I'm here today to stir our hearts because there is a, a window of opportunity that we have, but it's a very slim one, and it's closing very fast. I don't know if you noticed in the last few years the uptake of evil that's taken place in our nation, but but we're going to hell so fast. I believe it's a blessing that God is allowing it so that we will wake up as a church and recognize what we need to do and who we need to be. And the unfortunate and the downside of the German believers and the Christians in the 1930s and 40s resulted in millions of lives being lost. There were almost a half a million lives, American lives, that were lost. Not to mention six million Jews who were annihilated. And many thousands and hundreds of thousands from other countries because the church in Germany didn't do what they were supposed to do. And if you were to ask many of those leaders, even today, there is a heavy oppression and a shame that was carried over eight decades later. These pastors are still carrying this burden that they failed in their time of trial. And we do not want to be that same church. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer continued to speak out against Hitler and the Nazi regime, and he even became a part of a a coup to overthrow and see him assassinated. Now, some of you would say, oh, that's that's not Christian anymore. Uh, He's crossed the line. And he got in prison, and then he was executed later on for it. You know, I I get sometimes people throw up Romans 13 to me and they say, Pastor, it says to respect the government authorities and do what they tell us to do. And guess what? You are supposed to respect the governing authorities and tell us and, and do what they tell us to do until they tell you to do something that God hasn't told you to do. And when they tell you to do something that God hasn't told you to do, you're no longer obligated to obey The law of the land. The law of the land is to be based on the law of God, not the law of man. And when the law of the land is no longer obedient to the law of God, you no longer have to be obedient to the law of the land. You say, well, that's just, that's rebellion, pastor. There are many instances in scripture when Rahab brought the brought in the spies into her house. And then, then, then they came and they asked her, did you have spies here? She said, no. <laughs> yes, she lied. And she lied for the right reason. 
And God honored her for that. And I, I think it's important that we understand that there is a place that we, do, that we don't honor man. We respect it, the governing authorities. But again, I'll say this one more time. Until they ask us to do what is ungodly. And that's where the line ends. And that's where our voice needs to begin. I love you. Okay. So Bonhoeffer gets executed. But the thing was is that he wasn't afraid to die. Because he knew who he was in Christ. And see, to be in Christ, when we say I'm in Christ, it means that it's better to, uh, to die in Christ. I have more gain if I'm in Christ than I die. In Jesus, we believe by faith that he overcame death. And if Jesus overcame death, and he says, death, where is your sting? You have no more fear. As if we're Christians, we shouldn't be afraid of death. And if we're afraid of causing somebody to be upset with us because of what we believe about God and our faith, then we need to question what we believe. Because if you're afraid of people, you no longer have the fear of God. It's, an, it's really a simple issue. I know it, sometimes it seems complicated. What should I do? Are you gonna fear God or are you gonna fear man? It's, it, it really is pretty easy. Hmm. You might say you believe in him, but do your actions show that? I believe in God. Listen, God will decide whether you believe in him or not. And you know how he will decide? He will look at what you're doing. You say, well, no, that's faith-based works. You can't get saved by works. This is not about works. This is about the fruit of your salvation. If you say, I'm a believer, then there should be fruit, which means now you're going to obey what he told you to do. If you're doing the minimum to just stay out of hell, understand that your heart is not towards heaven. Your heart is towards you. If you're just concerned about saving your own your rear end, then you need to question whether or not or how deeply you love God. Because there's no fear in death in Christ. No fear of man. No fear of death. And, and listen, I'm not trying to start a riot here, but I am. Right? I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get, get people all riled up and and do things that are stupid. I'm, I'm trying to get the people of God to understand the word of God so that we can speak the truth of God into a culture that is godless. Yeah. Right? You know, in the parable, Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, he gives one guy talents, five, and he gives another a few. And then... They, they, they obey him. He says, take these and invest them, and I'm coming back. They obey him. They invest them because they love him. But then there was the one guy who had one talent, and he said, I know that you're shrewd. I know that you're, you're a harsh taskmaster, so I just held on it. And this guy did the bare minimum. And Jesus said, because you wanted to get by with doing the bare minimum, you condemn yourself. And church, if we're living to just do the bare minimum as a Christian, if you're living just so that you don't go to hell, you better question whether or not you're going to heaven. Hitler's just going to be a one-term Fuhrer. And the church of Germany had a lot of theological reasonings why this was okay for them to not get involved, to not rock the boat. And we've bought into the same belief here in the church in America that the problems that we see today, we shouldn't engage in. They're just, they're passing. They're, they'll be gone. Wait till next, wait till next November. 
The election, that'll change it. Listen, you cannot legislate morality. It has to come from a heart after God. The election's gonna come and go. If God's people haven't changed, one person in one office doesn't change a nation. God didn't say the president or the king is going to, going to make the nation great. He said the people of God would. The people of God are the salt and the light in the land. <laughs> Things aren't going to change until God's people change. Until we decide, till we make, till we elect ourselves that we're no longer going to be politically correct. And that we're going to speak truth. So you can't say you love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then at the same time, let evil run rampant around while being silent. This is the issue that we face today. Church. Do not think that because you live in comfortable Southwest Florida in the United States of America that you're going to be covered when all hell breaks loose. Right now, I don't know if you noticed, but it's broken loose. And if you've been doing this or this for the last few years and you've missed it all, guess what? The devil has introduced more, more satanic ideologies into our culture in the last few years than in decades and centuries he has before. Why? Because the church said, oh, it's just going to let it pass. We're good. Look at us. We're, we're good. We're good. Look how much freedom we got. When people say, you can't talk about that, Pastor, my first response is, this is the United States of America. The Constitution says... I'm free to talk about whatever I want to talk about. But lest we fall into patriotism for the wrong reason, there's a greater purpose behind that, and it's the kingdom of God. I have an allegiance to the kingdom of God. And when something runs countercultural to the word of God and to the kingdom of God, I have an even greater responsibility, not because I'm an American citizen, but because I'm a citizen of heaven. I have a greater responsibility to stand up and speak truth to the lies that are being told today. Jesus called the Pharisees hypocrites when he saw what they did when no one was looking. He said, I see how you shut up when you should be speaking up. William Wilberforce was a Christian who began the, the, the movement of abolition of slavery. And he went to Parliament and he told them, slavery is wrong. It's sinful. It's wicked. And it needs, slave trade needs to be stopped. And there were people who were Christians told him, don't rock the boat. Stay in your lane. This is political. This is not, this is not a religious issue. This is a political issue. And he says, no, this is a moral issue. This is a, this is a moral issue. We're talking about people. And there are Christians today who are saying the, the same thing. Well, this is church and state. Divide it needs to be divided, church and state. You know who instituted the whole idea of church and state? It was the church, not the state. And the purpose of, was so that we would continue to have the right to speak freely in the culture that we live in. And somehow, that's flipped on its end, and we've just been quiet about it. Now the state is saying, yes, there's a separation of church and state, and we're on top, and you listen to us. That was never the intention. Democracy was never the intention of God. It was a theocracy that God ruled the world, not man. And there are Christians today who are saying, you, you shouldn't say these things, Pastor. You shouldn't talk about abortion. It's political. Don't, don't talk about it. It's not political. It's murder. If you've had an abortion, 
God forgives you when you ask him, when you say, God, forgive me. He forgives you. He wipes the slate clean. There's no condemnation for those who've gone through that. But it's sin. And when, when we're told, don't talk about that. Well, what about, the, what about those who are raped? You know less than 2% of pregnancies are caused by rape. Let's put it in perspective. I'll tell you why this is an issue. And I'm, I'm just wondering why people aren't saying this. Because well, there should, we should have the right, women should have a right to an abortion. No. If men and women would choose to, uh, to have been obedient to God's word, to abstain from sexual immorality outside of the marriage covenant, there would never be unwanted babies. Pastor, don't talk, don't talk about transgender issues. That's political. No, it's not political. It's moral. It's immoral. It's, I, I, still, I still today, and I, I just, gosh, I, I, I cringe when I think about, why, how did we get here? How did we get to a point, listen, A rooster has never laid an egg. I don't know how we're thinking, what we're thinking, that all of a sudden somebody who is a male says, I'm not a male anymore. I'm a female. You can't do that. But because we are afraid of hurting somebody's feelings, because this is the way they feel, it's not about the way you feel. It's about the way God made you. Let me tell you what's going on here. God created them male and female. And they're, listen, don't clap. Listen, you can later. There's two, there's two sexes and that's it. And he said male and female. And he didn't say that there's, you get to pick. All of a sudden, well, I didn't like that. Here's, here's why this is wrong. The first commandment says that you're to love the Lord your God and have no other gods before him. When you decide that the way you want your life to be is better than the way that God designed you to be, that's saying you're God. You've just put yourself on the throne and you've broken the first commandment. And yet that's happening all over our country right now. And people are going, well, I guess if they want to be a girl, they can be a girl. Man, have we got to wake up. And we've we've got to acknowledge that whether it's critical race theory, whether it's the woke ideology, whatever socialism or Marxism it may be, anything and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Some of you are going, oh, you're a racist. No, I'm very much against racism. It's wrong. It's sinful. We should abolish racism. That other, you can't tell me that the, the critical race theory and, the, and this whole thing of woke ideology, it's based on atheistic Marxism. It's not biblical. Right? Okay? So understand, anything that's exalting itself against the knowledge of God, the scripture says that we're to pull it down. Pull it down. And you know who does that? You. Us. We need to be the church. We're salt in the earth. Don't say anything about border control, Pastor. That's political. Let let me tell you, our own direct, you know how much fentanyl is being trafficked in to our country right now? I want to read you a quote. I think I, I put this in here. Yes, this is from the, the, the administrator of the DEA, okay? And she says, fentanyl is the single deadliest drug threat our nation has ever encountered. This isn't a political issue. This is a moral issue. Do you know how many thousands of people have died from fentanyl overdoses? And yet we're going, no, it's just a political thing. No, it's not. It's an issue that we need to be speaking out against. Sure got quiet in here. Mm. It's not the government's job to determine the truth. It's our job to determine the truth. 
And we hope to have people in government who are believers in Christ, and that just makes it easier for us. But you can't depend on people in government for being Christians. You've got to be a Christian yourself. And every opportunity that you get, and every, every chance that you can to be a, an influence in the sphere that you've been given, you need to take it. Jesus died a horrible death so that we can have freedom. There are thousands of people of our descendants who, who laid their lives down so that we could have physical freedom. And the lies of, of the devil have continually been perpetrated throughout, or perpetuated throughout our, our culture. And, and we're just sitting back and going, well, I guess yeah, I don't want to rock the boat. Hey, it's going to pass. I shouldn't say anything about that. It's political. It's not. That's called shirking our responsibility. And that window, it gets slimmer by the minute. And there are millions of people in our nation right now who are depending on a church, the church of Jesus Christ, to actually live like they believe it. What does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his own soul? What do we do about this? Well, for the last few months, I've gone into my bathroom at night, and I turn the light on, and there's been these carpenter ants with the wings, and been a few here and there on the ceiling. I was like, where do they come from? So, you know, kill them. Next night, a couple more, and you know what? After a while, you're just like, oh, yeah, there's going to be carpenter ants in my bathroom tonight. I guess I got to kill them. And for a few, you know, this, I know you're, you're like, get rid of the ants. So it took a while. I was like, I think they'll go away. I think they'll go away. I think they'll go away. I'm thinking they're going to go away. You know what? Something that's broke doesn't fix itself on its own. And every night I go in, I'm thinking, well, maybe they stopped coming. There'd be more. And a few nights ago, I went in the bathroom, and I turned on the light, and they were everywhere. They're, they're, they're like, they're over my mirror, they're crawling, some of them are coming down the wall, and I was like, this is more than my floss water can handle right now. So I went in the garage, I got the, the can of bug spray, and I sprayed a bunch of them and killed them, but now I'm mad. I'm mad because there's an infestation going on where I live. And tonight, I'm not going to stop at just killing them. I'm going to keep going till I find them. So I'm up in the attic. And I'm in the crawl space where you can't crawl anymore. You know, at the end of the pitch of the roof, right here. And there's no space in there. And there's no support. You're just bare knees on top of trusses, right? And you're, you're trying, you're getting cramps in, in every muscle that's trying to hold on. And I get back to the part where I thought they were coming through the exhaust fan into the bathroom. I'm thinking, that's where they're coming from. I'd went up on the roof and sprayed down in there, right? And so now I'm looking and I see nothing. And I'm, I come down, I'm soaking wet, sweat, just, I come in and I come in the bathroom and Dina can tell, like, I'm on a mission. I'm going to tear the house apart tonight. And, <laughs> and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to find these bugs. I can't tell where they're coming from. They're coming from somewhere. I want to find it. And well, that was, that was part of it. I said, I'm going to find these books. She said, well, they're coming from somewhere. I was like, yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> I've spent the last hour of my life risking it on the roof and in the attic. I know they're somewhere, and I know that's truth. And then she walks over, and it looked like the bathroom window was closed, but it was cracked about that much. And she goes... She goes, eh, the window was open. <laughs> now, I haven't seen any since. <laughs> right? We as the people of God 
need to start systematically shutting windows. And you might not be able to shut the White House. And you might not be able to go into the Supreme Court justice tomorrow and change a law. But you can change one in your own life. You can start, you can start being a voice wherever you are. You can start taking a stand against the things in our culture that you know are wrong. If there's, if there's a bill, and listen, there is one, and I'm going to be talking more about it. There's one right now. There's a bill that's trying to be, be passed in Florida to enshrine the legalization of abortion so that we could never even uh, attack it again. It would be unconstitutional if this passed and it would be we would be a, a state that that people would would migrate to 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 see that happen there's so there's an amendment to that bill that's coming up in february of next year we're gonna we're gonna be uh, signing petitions for that there is uh, if you if you're a parent and you've got kids in the public school you need to be at every school board meeting saying hey Biologically, could you tell me why we're even having this discussion about transgenderism? Could you, could you show me what that even looks like? You know, this is offensive to a holy God. That's the, that's the reality. Forget about trying to just protect your children. Let's walk in the fear of God and say and speak on behalf of God. There's something, I'm going to close with this. It's called the spiral of influence. And Eric Metaxas writes about this. He said, when a person stays quiet, it encourages others to stay quiet. But when it works conversely too, when one person has the courage to speak, it encourages others to speak. And I want to encourage you. You have opportunity wherever you are to speak, to live, to act. Let's do it. Would you stand up with me? Father, today, we're confronted by the truth of your word. We're confronted by our own inaction, and we repent, and we ask you to forgive us. Lord, we see the state of our world around us and we deem it unacceptable today. And today, Father, we listen and we hearken our voice to your Holy Spirit and we're praying, show us, God, where we can be salt, where we're to be light. We pray for these appointments and these opportunities and we're asking for the courage to speak when we need to speak. And we pray that we would have not, uh, we'd have faith and not fear, that we would walk by faith and that when we're confronted and we know that we will be confronted, that we will have the boldness to stand in the day of adversity. Lord, make us a people that you would be proud of, that you would say, well done, good and faithful servants. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. On the count of three, we're going to shout and go out. Are you ready? You're going to go out, and you're going to continue to shout. Okay? It's not about shouting in here, then going outside and going. It's just, this is to get the shout started. The rest of the week needs to be louder than this. Right? All right, here we go. One, two, three. Lead someone to life. Amen.